Okay, welcome back, group. Um, I am Fighting Kentuckian, and I'm here with... Windhurst Productions. We're back for another great episode of On Patrol. Um, in this episode, episode 8, we're going to talk about muskets and tomahawks, one of our favorite rule sets from the past here and making a resurgence. And we're specifically looking into version 1 versus version 2, kind of a comparison in this episode. Um, the change, you know, is it a good thing? Uh, a Brave New World or Lose Your Scalp in Version 1 versus Version 2. And again, saying Brave New World is Version 1, you know, has been out almost a decade. But when you look at Version 2, it's still been out on the market about three years. So these new, these rule sets aren't new, but we wanted to kind of go back, take a little bit of scratch at these rule sets. And then as we know rule sets changes, we wanted to kind of do a little bit of a deep dive. But before we talk about that... I want to turn it over to Windhurst Productions to talk about our, our next section. Yep. So, as always, before we like to get in the meat and potatoes, we like to talk about our alibis, caveats, and pigats from last episode or any previous episode. Um, uh, so, from last episode, you know, we talked about bases. Um, as everyone uh, probably saw, I, I finally finished the Normans, but the units looked a little smaller than they had previously and they were in trays after the last episode i talked about oh i'm going to try this thing where they're on 40 millimeter squares you know magnetized um well um everything's iterative and i had did a little bit of movement play testing on a smaller game and it just did not work don't recommend it um at least not on teddy bear fur mats really hard to grab the sides of the model so i ended up going to trays um and but that's something i think we hit on on that episode that you know Usually it's hard to find one thing that works for all situations. Um, you're probably not, um, but being flexible and willing to adapt. So that was something that um, I'd learned just since last episode. <clears throat> also, I, I, uh, one of our listeners reached out to me um, after they had listened to our episode six, where we were talking about our, our paint stations. And both Kentucky and I had mentioned the difficulty we have in getting our brushes to last a while. Um, and they reached out and was like, yeah, I just listened to episode six and... Um, you know, I've got brushes from the 80s that are, are I'm still using um, and some, you know, bigger brushes and some fine tip brushes that have lasted a few years. And I'm like, OK, great. Well, what's your secret? Um, please tell me. Um, and they're like, well, their technique is they rinse their brush before they put more paint on it. Um, and so you I think obviously that's the key there. They're they're rinsing it so much that paint doesn't have a chance to build up um, even where you can't get it out from a good wash. Um, so I'd really appreciate it that it's uh, Miko, um, who follows me on, on Instagram, reached out. Um, and we, we want to hear from you all. We love hearing from you all, especially when you've got you know ideas or suggestions from something we've mentioned. So I just wanted to give them a shout out and that I appreciate them hit me up with that suggestion and that advice that I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, Kentucky, do you have any alibis, caveats, and peabats from the past? Um, just again, we talked about last episode with the basing, like you said, I'm still experimenting and trying some different things out, especially where I play some multiple ancient rule sets. Um, and I'm, I'm always putting out, you know, requests for informations on there. If you have a way that you've played several rule sets, you know, just keep us in mind, keep posting us. If you, if you listen to this episode a while after we heard it, um, I think just Again, give us that shout, give us that nod, share that information with us. And the same goes as we kind of make our way into this episode, you know, for the listener who's listening and like, God, these idiots again, you know, they've missed this whole point. Please, you know, message us. We're very approachable. Shoot us uh, a message. Give us a, you know, a, a, any any type of request or anything for saying, hey, or check this out or, or you know, whatever you need to do and a uh, flashing neon sign that says, what about this, or this is how I do that, you know, if we seem to miss the boat. We really appreciate the comments and criticisms. We, uh, it helps make us better and helps, you know, kind of get to those answers that we all want to get to. Um, but no, no other, no other kind of alibis, caveats, and piggybacks for me. Um, we'll kind of move into the outline here and, and what we hope to achieve. So going into this rule set, uh, and this, these two rule sets versions, uh, change is almost inevitable in the world. And the same is true about wargaming rule sets. So how do authors avoid the dreaded problem of making something stale? Or even worse, making the tiny change that implodes the system on itself? 
Um, so what edition of 40k are we on? No, that's a joke. That's a joke. You know, I'm not. <laughs> we don't I'm really not care. <laughs> here to just disparage you. Uh, so in this episode, Winhurst uh, and myself, you know, we wanted to examine one of the most popular black powder skirmish rule sets in North America that's set during that 18th century, and how this rule set kind of evolved in its second edition and version. Uh, to the new frontiers, you know, maybe Europe, question mark. Uh, we'll talk about that. Card decks, command points, and we'll get into that. But with almost a decade in version 1, and now, you know, a pretty healthy uh, slew of playtesting in version 3, version 2, I mean, with three years, uh, we wanted to take a deep dive into both of those versions and talk about our likes, dislikes, and if the rule set kind of stands up on the brave new frontier like we talked about, or maybe ends up scalped at the bottom of the bin. Um, the biggest thing is to keep in mind here, uh, you know, and Windhurst will help outline here in the first few sections, we're going to keep the same rubric that we had when we went through Chain of Command and Bolt Action. We want to keep some kind of consistency to the scores and the sections about the book, other things like that, playability. But again, we're not comparing, I would say, something as different as apples and oranges. You know, it's maybe... Uh, green apples and red apples here, or it's the it's the same rule set uh, to some degree at bottom, uh, but we wanted to talk about the additions and what it is. So although we'll use the same rubric, expect for a lot of our time uh, to be spent in some of the the weeds of the playabilities and the rules mechanic and the changes. Uh, so with all that being said, uh, grab your spear, your shield, your musket, and maybe that uh, nicely sharpened tomahawk and that belt-fed machine gun, and join us on this episode of On Patrol. Winhurst, take us away. Thank you, Kentuckian. So for our first um, section that we want to cover, we're going to at the very surface level look at the presentation. Um, so here, like we did uh, in our previous rule comparison, we were looking at books, PDFs, eBooks. you know, um, what's available, how it's laid out, and things like that. Uh, so under presentation, the first thing we want to talk about is how is it laid out. Um, from looking at both of them side by side, they are fairly comparable in, in layout. Um, even in, in the order and flow of things it is fairly consistent. Um, big difference you'll notice right away looking at it is version one or first edition was a fairly sturdy, but paperback and it was black and white. Um, whereas version episode, um, second edition is a hardback full color. It also is a good bit bigger, um, I think it's around uh, 80 some pages versus uh, first edition, only around 60 some pages. Um, but that, those are the biggest things as far as layout, um, as well as second edition pulled the army list out of the main book and made it a supplement. Um, Kentucky, and for, was there anything else in a layout that you really noticed or really stood out to you? No, the uh, just like you said, it's the the sixty pages that has everything with the army list in it, and I think it's just important here. With uh, it looks like they're going to build already. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit later on with shakos and bayonets and those and those things. But the the forty two page supplement, so it definitely has a little bit more depth to it in the layout. Um, but it's, I mean, it's a beautiful book. It is. It's top quality, beautiful book. And we'll. I, I know you're going to go through some other things in here to to talk about that but that's as far as layout that's that's my only comments there yeah what did you feel Kentucky, about how ease um or intuitive it was to read the book i think both are pretty great um as far as that muskets and tomahawks um when i went back through it you know the version one you're when you're talking about like it's really only 30 pages i've got it here in front of me of rules you know like you get to uh let's see here you get to the scenarios and stuff on like page 37 and building combatants and then you really start the army lists on page 40 so like 40 pages of rules but man does it it, it has it to where it's pretty decently laid out we'll talk about a few things i think that are left out but as far as easy and intuitive i think it's there um the nuance of the second edition uh which will <laughs> it's kind of like a little bit of a spoiler here um, there's some things that I think maybe could be, uh, maybe a little bit smoother or cleaner or says where it references, maybe a little bit better, like, Hey, go back to this section, maybe in broader lights. But I, I think they're both there. They're both above average and being easy and intuitive. And I, 
Muskets and Tomahawks version one is definitely, you know, you can't get much more concise and stuff than in, in 30 or 40 pages of, of a great rule set. So those are my thoughts on the easy and intuitive. What about you? Yeah, I didn't have any problems going back reading uh, version one um, after a couple of years since I've played it. It it is very familiar, very easy to read through. Um, the only thing I had issues with in version two was some of the um, titles or sections. They use a very fancy kind of cursive text for um yeah and and sometimes i was like i'm not sure what this word is until i i saw it in you know regular longhand later on it's like oh that's what it was because i mean i don't use i mean i know how to write cursive i just don't use it super regularly and i rarely see anyone else use it so kind of going back and being like man what the heck was that supposed to say let me find it later on in it um i don't know i i don't think it was a necessary change to make it all fancy and it kind of slowed it down a little bit but that was the only critique i had as far as intuitive or ease of read um, from either of them yeah my caveat to that is remember uh listeners me and windhurst are on the frontier at the trading post in kentucky you know that's where we're from <laughs> so uh we're we, we don't like your fancy highfalutin stuff all right we're pretty pretty, pretty uh bare bones no I, I i completely agree it is a beautiful book and everything but uh, some of those sections uh, maybe could be a little bit more uh, stand out. Yeah, so mind. speaking on that, um, the next one is how do the sections build on each other? I, I feel like they both built on each other really well, Verge, They and they're actually pretty comparable side by side, as in they keep relatively the same order from first to second edition. They did move a, a couple of things around. Um so they swapped the positioning of movement and spotting in first edition to second edition. Um, mm-hmm. And I let's see, what was it? In second edition, I don't... I'm trying to go to my table. Um, so they went... They did spotting before movement, where in, in the first edition it was movement and then spotting. I kind of feel like it should have been moving and then spotting because then it would go into shooting, and that just seems to make more sense to me. But it wasn't a change that I felt like confused me. It just was less intuitive. Um, and they also, let's see, what was it? They moved terrain, where they talk about terrain further back into the book. And like so officers and the army yep. moved up. And I actually think that was a good move. Like Either you want terrain right next to movement or you want it way in the back like before table setup. Um, and so I think the positioning in, in version 2 was a, a bit more optimal. What were your thoughts on how they build on each other. No, I agree in that. It makes me think of like most skirmish games, you know, sometimes I, I I'm fine with the layout of number two. I think you can't, every skirmish game is going to run into this where you're talking about such a low model count and stuff is going to interact, uh, in a way with each other. That's, you know, immediately, or, you know, and talking about the terrain that you're doing with spotting and versus how does that affect movement? So I think it's kind of hard to make it extrapolate all the different sections. And I thought, it, you know, both books did about as good a job as any book could do when you're talking about these things, um, making sure they connect. And, yeah, so I, I'm tipping my cap to them on, on those, and I kind of just second your comments. That was fine to put terrain in the back uh, based on with when you were getting into the table. Yeah. No, no issues for me on that. Yeah, so next little section, um, diagrams. Um, I felt... Looking at them, there's pretty much very similar numbers of diagrams and and charts. So diagrams, um, I more mean like like maybe like a top down look showing like you know line of sight and position. Where charts, being you know if you roll this, here's the chart you compare to. Um, even though second edition is longer, it didn't feel like there were that many more charts or diagrams. So maybe they're just spread out a little bit more. But both rules are to me, it's a good number. Um, for a set of skirmish rules, um, as far as helping you understand and explain the game, one thing we'll kind of talk about a little bit more more on mechanics. But muskets and tomahawks is a little bit chart heavy um, compared to some other skirmish games. You're really going to want that quick reference sheet <laughs> on hand when you're playing. At least I definitely did. Um, so I, I felt they were fairly comparable as as far as that. I will say. Second uh, edition does much better on their reaction table chart 
um, than first edition because first edition you had like here's what you rolled and it might have like a big category like the first column is you know three through four and the next one's like four through three through six but there was no lines really dividing it so you're like oh man if you're looking way to the right you're like man which which number does this fall under um that was a little bit annoying but on second edition they fixed that and they had nice little lines going all the way across which i liked um, what were your thoughts on, on their diagrams and charts, Kentuckian? The diagrams, charts, and like example stuff, um, I'll kind of lump them all together. Version one, I will say one thing of, even if I don't play that rule book, the one thing that's probably going to make me buy it is when I look out and it's got pretty pictures in it. Um, I love having the ability, like that's number one. I love having the ability to see stuff that's painted in the style and the era. That's, I mean, and I think most war gamers, uh, those veteran war gamers for sure, are like that. Where, you know, sometimes I'll use a rule book alone just for reference. Like, man, that is just awesome the way they did that, or a scenario or something out of it. And so, version two is like hands down, it's a beautiful book, beautiful pictures. Uh, where version one is kind of black and white. Um, you know, you don't have the aesthetics there of the unit, the different Indian tribe kind of paint schemes and stuff, or just, you know, to see how people have painted their models and do those things. So, like, version 2 is, uh, love it, love it, love it. Um, also, I think version 2 has a lot of decent examples, um, from what I've seen with diagrams, not just diagrams, but, um the models like overhead i want to say if it was in movement i can't remember what section it was let's see here i, I think it was in terrain yeah some of terrain and then i'm in the armory talking about the guns overhead view of like this the shots and um obstacles all those things great beautiful pictures uh kind of like lines it up those things are awesome to have um, so huge fan of, of version two and what it's done. And even if you don't play the game, you know, you, you, you do something else um, in that period. Like the book is worth picking up just for those uh, beautiful, you know, examples of, of painted miniatures and scenes and stuff. Uh, just amazing. But as far as, as that, version one has some great charts, especially when you get in terrain, like facing and everything. But looking overhead, I'm in the... Uh, let's see what page is it on. It's one of the earlier pages. Yeah, there's one. Uh, yeah, it's on page 13. Line of sight. Page 13 in version one. It's like overhead of a soldier, and you're like, I don't know who that troop is. There's some decent pictures in there, but, um, you know, and again, everybody, almighty dollar, you know, I'm sure this company had to put it, push something out and everything, but just version two with the beautiful pictures and the color terrain it just it helped it pop in my mind especially where you have the lines that can be brighter or a little bit off color to show hey this is what we're talking about here's where the stone wall is here's these things those are um just just help the player to to make that much more easy a transition of like oh this is what they mean um where it's not just all black and white yeah you, you hit on examples um I, I agree i felt like they both had great examples uh, and we're fairly comparable. Um, quick reference sheets. I'm I'm a little on the fence on this. So first editions, um, they both do have quick reference sheets, and they're both in the books. You know that was a pet peeve of mine for the last re review. Um, I love my quick reference sheets, and when they before they came out with second edition, it was available on Studio Tomahawk's website for first. Now that second edition's out, they do have the quick reference sheet downloadable from their website. That's awesome. I love that. Very handy and good support from the company. Um, first edition, so it's one page and it's very straightforward. You got spotting, reactions, some movement modifiers, and some weapon stuff. It's it's fairly low threat. It's kind of like really those three charts that are most important. Whereas you know your second edition quick reference chart is front and back. Um, and I mean it's to me. There's a couple things on here that maybe are a little unnecessary. Like they have movement rates, which used to just be in the stat block in first edition, but they kind of took out. Um, I don't know if that's really necessary. You could put that on your, tr you know, if you had uh, army roster, that that could go there. Terrain types. I mean, maybe it's a good reference, but it's it's really just saying is it an obstacle? Is it low in cover? So. I, I, I don't know, as more an experienced gamer, usually that's the kind of stuff we hash out at the beginning of the game. I don't really need like a chart to tell me what this is. So I don't know if they're just playing for space. Um, 
Otherwise, it's fairly useful other than I just had some issues with their placement of ranged weapons and shooting. We're kind of right next to each other, which is a kind of mechanic we'll talk about later. Um, but it, it, le it led to some spots where I ended up using kind of like the, the lethality of the weapon as my shoot baseline and then adding the shooting modifiers to it just because I got a little confused on one of my test games. Um, I don't know. There could have been maybe a better way to to do that maybe even just swapping their position but i do like having my quick reference sheet and they I, they were very handy both of them were very handy and very useful what were your thoughts yeah um again a little bit meatier quick reference sheet with the second edition but uh needs needs to be that way um kind of agree with you i know that they've simplified spotting and there there's other stuff that they've added that was nuanced that goes on the quick reference sheet but there were some things where I wonder if you can shrink that down to what you need to know a little bit more or if there's an aftermarket one out there where, you know, even in some of the skirmish like the World War II sets we play where you can get down a, a decent rule set to one page. Because at the end of the day, I think when you get to that one page, that's, you know, the golden ticket. If you can, if you can get it down to one page. But, th yeah, those are my only thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, finally, uh, well, the main last little topic, uh, subtopic in this was indexes. Neither of them have an index. It doesn't seem really common much anymore in rule. A lot of rules don't have indexes. Um, with rules that have them, do you find that you use them an awful lot, Kentuckian? I, with, I, I really wanted to kind of, you know, we get down to this as like a pet peeve because I think me and you like going back and forth and like flipping through it and tabbing books out or you know at least like referencing stuff especially like the hot contested rules but when you're talking about a rule set that's like 30 or 40 pages you know i i guess you know maybe you don't really need it uh, and maybe it's something that's not not needed i still like having it there but yeah that would be my only kind of thought is it is such a slim when you talk about like the you know world war ii skirmish being 200 pages or something like that or a different but when you're down to those 30 or 40 pages or of actual, you know, like hard, fast rules, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a make or break. I'll say I, that. I feel like first edition didn't need one, but maybe second edition would have benefited from one, considering it's a bigger book of just rules. You know, it might make finding yeah. stuff a little bit faster, but... Yeah, um, I, I, would, so, I would concur with that. It, I, I, I added a little subsection to this that I don't think we had an original um, outline, but I wanted to also talk about the army lists as far as it goes in presentation. And specifically because the army list is pulled out in second edition. So first edition, I would say, is a fairly sturdy paperback. I don't know what your copy is like, Kentuckian, but my second edition army list like supplement, I feel it's very flimsy and not very... Like, it's not going to last as long. I don't know what your thoughts are. It's just the the integrity of the book itself. It's fairly flimsy. Um, yeah, my version one, I've got two editions of it, and they're pretty, like, one's pretty worn, and one's, you know, I didn't try to play with a lot. I kind of try to leave, like, a pristine one. I'm always buying books and at least keeping one back just to have, you know, so you don't spill that whatever drink or food you have at the table. With version two, I agree with you. The army book, I mean, it is very comprehensive to be a, a second edition book. I'm not totally against them pulling it out. You know, you can tell the writing on the wall with uh, the main book. Um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later with, um, you know, they've got pictures of the Civil War, Anglo-Zulu War, you know, modest stuff in there. So the I think the intent was is that they're going to make pretty comprehensive books for each one. Um you know, be interesting to see where that is. You've, you've got the Shakos and Bayonets out right now, but we've been three years. I don't really know if I've seen, and maybe I've just missed it, but being on Studio Tomahawk's website, I haven't really seen additional ones. So I guess it'll see. we'll see where they go with that with the QuickBooks. I, I do agree, the, the Red Coats and Tomahawks, the supplement for the French Indian and, and, and that stuff, don't know... Um, uh, maybe it would have helped to have it as a, a kind of a bound hard hardback, or um, and I really haven't in the three years or whatever you know that it's been out. I mine's not too worn just yet, but we'll see how it holds up. I guess undecided on that, but um, yeah, I, you it know, just we, feels we a little flimsy going. to me. Um, 
Yeah, but I feel like the army list itself, they've added a, a bit more information, like usability as far as like um, how the layout of the points are. Um, they, you know, I, I, neither of us have the Napoleonic supplement uh, army list. Um, but if the intent is, because the first edition rules say in the beginning they're intended for 18th century. Second edition says it's 18th to 19th century, like early 19th century. So mm -hmm. if that is their intent, and, and I hope it, they keep pushing stuff out for it because I like the company, I like the rules. Um, I definitely could see the need for pulling out into supplements because, you know, they have some special rules um, that apply kind of more towards the French Indian War period, like the use of boats, um, a, a period-specific random events table, some scenario specific towards this period, um, which is, you know, it just... I guess if you're getting these set of rules and there's a period you specifically like and want to use them for, having a supplement for that period is very useful. Kind of like with bolt action. You know, if you, you like the rules but you only want to do North Africa, then you're going to get the North Africa supplement because that's going to give you all the the more nitty-gritty that you want for the period you're interested in. Um, but yeah, that was my, any final thoughts, Kentucky in on presentation, and then what did you score it? Yeah, no. So my, my last one here that kind of, I, I guess I glossed over in the first one is no PDF. And I hate that. Yeah, neither of them. Um, I don't think there's PDF or, or ebook yeah, option. It, it, yeah, no PDF even option. And my, I think I know why uh, gaming companies are doing that, right? When we talk about 3D printing and sharing and STLs and like everything else where you can just kind of like I don't know if piracy is the right word, but I know that PDFs from all the wargaming groups I'm on, it's kind of like, hey, can you send me that PDF? I bought the rules or something like that. And I, I know companies are going to try to protect their intellectual property at the end of the day. But personally, normally when I buy a set, I'll buy a PDF. You know, I think me and you, especially being in service, whether you're traveling or not, it's great to have that when you have the opportunity or a device that'll hold a charge where you can read that stuff. And I normally like kind of reading that stuff. If I'm getting ready to, you know, lay down or getting ready to pass out or something, those are good kind of reference materials. I love the fact I can kind of look at those things at night or, again, while I'm traveling and doing, doing other things like that. So I'd, I really wish there was a PDF option. Understand, I, I think the companies are, are kind of the ones that don't go towards those are just kind of, hey, we want to make sure you buy the rule book. Um, and, and that's my thought. I wish they had it. I, I hate it. Um, so that's my only thought about the PDFs. Do you have any thoughts on PDFs before I move to scores? Yeah, the only thing I, my concern with the company is, like you said, it's been three years, and they haven't done another reprint, to my knowledge. And most sites that did carry it are out of stock. So I would, either, I would encourage the company to either do a reprint, which might not be cost-effective, I don't know, if, depending on how well it's sold, or... Maybe they could go, like, after so many years, instead of doing a reprint, do a PDF version that's available. And then, it, like, then way if we introduce it to somebody, it's like, well, you can't buy the rules, but you can buy a PDF version. You know, they're still making sales. They're still encouraging the growth and involvement of the game. Um, because I know I ran into that with first edition. It had been out so long before second edition came out that you couldn't find the rules anywhere um, at all. Or, or the cards, and we'll talk about the cards a little bit later, but uh, that was a real problem. So I think a PDF either at the beginning or maybe a little bit, a couple years down the road, would really be beneficial. Yeah, no, totally, um, totally agree, and that's, so, that's so kind scoring. of the thought. We'll, we'll see, scores? hopefully Studio Tomahawk, somehow this gets back to them, right, and we, we see a PDF added to their site. <laughs> but, um, no, the, the, the big thing that I would say on scoring... With version one would be, um, I'm going to give it an eight. And I'm trying to, I'm a little bit of trying not to make it rest on its laurels today. But I'm just saying like time that it, um, but getting back to my scores. So version one, trying to not make it rest on its laurels for, you know, standing up with rule sets today. But still, you know, I guess I'm giving it a little bit of a handicap, but I'm going to put it at an eight. The reasons for an 8 are I do think it's super effective. It's all-inclusive with the list and everything in it. 
although it's you know my dings would be black and white and some of the examples and stuff with the with the edits um you know with the the, the fact that it's, it's still black and white and those things i still think it holds up to be the you know 40 to 60 pages of rules uh it's great game awesome book um, and my copy is still intact with my card, so love it. Definitely, it's uh, it's well above average. Um, makes my heart go pitter patter like it used to. So I'm I'm gonna hold that an eight. With version two, uh, kind of looking at the 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 core set of rules as well as red coats and tomahawks with it, I'm gonna give it a nine. And I think it's a beautiful book. Um, the dings on it, you know, of maybe the reference sheet. There's some things that they can do that obviously don't make it perfect. But it is beautiful. The pictures in there, the detailed lists in the red coats and tomahawks. I really love it. The only another like kind of ding on it why I don't get it to perfect is would have loved to seen some kind of historical scenarios. Love the scenario thing that's in there right now and some of those. But would have loved to seen maybe a, a few more historical scenarios that still use the system rather uh, than just the you know the generic raid and those stuff scenarios. But would have loved to seen an actual like. I don't know, maybe not a Fort Necessity, but something that would have been cool to take it over the top. Uh, but even with all those things, I, I definitely think version 2 uh, presentation is is top-notch, and that's why I give it a 9. Yeah, what so about you? For me, version 1, um, as it stands on its own, if, if it were to come out today, um, I gave it a 9. Um, I think the only thing that would have pushed it over to 10 for me um, was if it was in color. Um, otherwise, I love pretty much everything about it um and it, it gets one little ding for the reaction chart not being super clear on the lineup um but yeah for me i, I loved had no issues with version one i think it's 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 pretty great um but version two i also gave a nine um you know i do like that it's hardback in color um there's just a couple little things um that you know got it dings where it wasn't a 10 for layout um, the biggest one being that you have this really nice hardback, beautiful main rule book and what feels like a substandard quality in production of a supplement compared to the rule book. Like when you have them side by side, it's like this thing is flimsy and, you know, it's held together by two staples, um, and a little bit of glue and you know in the spine it just i don't know that that bothers me that you put so much effort into the main rule book which you can't use by itself because it doesn't have any army lists so you have to get the supplement mm -hmm. army list and it's way less quality um material wise that 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 kind of annoys me um but otherwise both of them nines for me um so that's all for that section yeah. can I, you want to start us off in the next one Okay, so moving on, we've talked about presentation. Let's go into what is the rule set trying to achieve? And this is us, you know, trying to meet the rule set where it's at, right? Not trying to make it bend to us. A lot of people always are like, well, this is what I think or this is, but, you know, what is it trying to achieve? And kind of asking in here, you know, what is the goal? Who's the intended audience? Does it meet the goal? And kind of shortfalls to the goal. So kind of looking out at the what is the goal, things that we look at when we see, when we see a rule set are, Okay, is it a realistic game? Is it narrative? Is it skirmish? Is it um, you know a tournament-based game? Like what? What is what is it trying to achieve? And so for me, this is a a fun skirmish game. Um, you know, in version uh, one here, that's got some definitely historical feel to it, but also there's some cookie cutterness of it with you have a few different traits. You have kind of uh, some generic stuff there. Um, with the with the Native Americans and with the actual units, and then with with version two, you know, you're a little bit more of a yes, it's a skirmish game, but it's a little bit nuanced. You've got the game within the game within the but with the cards, and especially being in your hand, and you've got the uh, and again, we're not we're not diving into the rules right now, but we're trying to say what is the rule set to achieve with a little bit more depth in the narratives that we see kind of some of these skirmish games go to. Um, with the, the side missions and the command points and those things. So that's my thought is, uh, you know, version one vanilla skirmish game with some nuanced things with the card driven system and that stuff with version two adding some nuance to it to give you a little bit more depth and a little bit more narrative. What about your thought, uh, Windhurst, on the goal? 
Yeah, so, I mean, just straight out from the books themselves, version one says it's a, <clears throat> you know, a skirmish level game for the 18th century, and version two says it's a skirmish level game for the 18th to 19th century. Um, and I felt like that, uh, though, and I'll talk about it a little bit more with some of these other subtopics, but I version one felt very much like it was tailored specifically for the North American theater in the 18th century. Um, so, you know, French and Indian War to the Revolutionary War, maybe War of 1812, and that's it. Like, even though they don't say, you know, you could use some of the army lists to do some other stuff, um, it really feels like that was the target, even if they don't spell it out. Um, where, you know, the version 2 are meant to be more generic rules to cover a bigger period with your supplements to kind of dive dive in. Um, I don't know, so I, I kind of felt like version 2 was less specific and, you know, the rules by themselves, because I don't think the supplements added a whole lot of period-specific flavor enough to be like, okay, this game is made for this period. Um but I think that was the, their goal was to cover a wider range. And so I think, you know, at least as far as in the skirmish level, and I, I think both of them, you know, were pretty clear on that. Yeah. And so, no, yeah. And I think we've, this is definitely not, you know, as of right now, like a term, tournament based game. And it's not a, um, it's not a, you know, super, um, I guess, ultra realistic. Uh, you know, chick counting game. It is made for that kind of one to two hour block um, of of fun and and getting a, a decent sized skirmish game in this period and giving you some flavor of it. Um, so, who is the intended audience? I think it's a little bit. You know, skirmish games can really be a catch all for a lot of people. In my um, you know essay, I think um, you know it, it's for anybody who's kind of into that skirmish war gaming as well as. Hey, this this age of black powder, just like you said with version one, it's are you more directed towards the North American conflict of that um, 18th century? Um, with version two, you you see that just who's the intended audience? Okay, this is for somebody who maybe the age of black powder in itself. Are we going to get some additional supplements besides just the shakos and bayonets? Those things. Um, who do you think you know the intended audience? Windhurst as well. Yeah, I think. Really, it's it's intended, I think, for war gamers who maybe are interested in this period, like the the you know black powder period, maybe specifically North America, um, and maybe you're not an expert on the period, but you have a you like it, you're interested in this period, and so it offers it's their intent is to offer enough. Um, realism so that your game feels like you feel like it should for that period it might not be super accurate you know if you're but it's not a simulation right i think it's um but it's not just like a a generic off-the-shelf skirmish game that you could just put in any setting um so i think it's kind of meant to be that middle road between um you know beer and pretzel and you know nitty-gritty simulation I, I to me that's kind of where it felt like it was meant it was trying to fall for the skirmish level yeah, no, and I, I, I kind of second that. Again, it's that some would call it a sweet spot. I think if you're if you're looking for the generic play, like you said, it maybe it's got some more depth to it and bite. And if you're looking for the ultra realistic, um, you're 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 not going to be. This isn't going to be your exact cup of tea. I think both genres of player will really enjoy both games, though. So that goes to our next question: like, what shortfalls, um, you know, do you see in this goal, or do you see with that? Um, with again the intended audience, and then what it's meant out to do, and does it does it achieve that? Um, yeah, like so. Even they don't say it. I feel like version one really does feel like 18th century North America when I play it. Um, from everything I've read, um, from the research I've done, from the films you watch, it feels like it, it nails it. However. They don't say that's the intended area. So you could say that's kind of a shortfall. I don't know. That's what I play version one for. That's what it got me into version one is I wanted to play North American um, 
French and Indian War specifically. And to me, it's absolutely perfect. Hits the spot. But they don't advertise themselves as specifically a French and Indian War game. So you might argue that they kind of miss the mark if it really feels best for that. I have played it for Revolution War a couple of times, and it, it felt all right. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of us kind of think American Revolution was a little bit more on the the line battle rank and file um, than the kind of more in the wood skirmishy. So I think the rules still work for both ways. Um, version two with the supplement really feels like it nails um, as well. Kind of that 18th century North America. I because I don't have the other supplement, I don't know how well they do at, at meeting that period, the kind of Napoleonics. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to say uh, for, for version two. What about you? Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right there on the, on the sense of, um, yeah, version one, I mean, not only in the rule set and the title, like you definitely feel like, hey, this is 18th century North America and either I'm a, a tribe leader or I'm a, a red coat or a French uh, officer and I'm out there in the frontier and this is like the pressure I have and you feel like the dynamic with the game and and the kind of nuances of the cards and those things like this gives you the tension that you would feel in that kind of engagement definitely a great thing with the you know kind of busting up the you go I go especially which is is great to do in skirmish the shortfalls, like you said, I kind of second. I would think the British listeners, the the Englanders, uh, you know, they're probably like, well, that's how you guys won the Revolutionary Wars. You, you wouldn't stand up and fight. You just shot at us in these small skirmishes that helped change the frontier. But um, I, I definitely think it, uh, you know, it achieves the goal overall and, and definitely a, a thumbs up for me with both versions. Uh, I'm, you know, as we, as we move into scoring with version one, I'm giving it a nine. I mean, it is something that, especially being from Appalachia and what was the frontier, you know, around this time, it's definitely, like you said, the research tied into history, the skirmish, the feel of it, the the, the units, the way they uh, maneuver, the way they, um, you know, kind of are out there on the tabletop and they get their different actions in version one. I'm giving it a nine. It, it definitely had that feel like either I was a, a ranger out there on the frontier, an Indian leader or a regular officer. And, and that's the tension you got, um, you know, what's lurking in the woods or, or how am I able to kind of raid this settlement with version two? I definitely think it gets there just as you kind of echoed. I do think there's some open endedness to how they, they wrote it. To, to get that age of black powder i feel like there's some stuff that's coming um maybe in the other supplements down the line but you know you kind of see in red coats and tomahawks or you'll see maybe in shakos and bayonets and for those that that have it and play that set please comment you know please please give us some feedback if you think it hits those um you know pet peeves of that period for you but i'm going to give it a nine as well so it's a very what is this rule set trying to achieve i think both achieve it um and, and i think they do it strongly as of right now but we see just with muskets and homahawks version two there's some r room to maneuver um but what about what about you and what do you think of the score on what is the rule set trying to achieve winters yeah honestly i'm i'm exactly where you're at i gave both of them nines i feel like for what i I feel like they're trying to put out there. They they met the intent um, very well. And I after all my test games over both editions, um, kind of going back, um, I still felt satisfied that I got out the experience out of it that I was expecting and I wanted. And at the end of the day, to me, that means the rules met their goal. If if you walk into a rule game within like this is the period I want to play and the feeling it should feel regardless. And when we say that, we don't necessarily mean it's super historically accurate. You should, because sometimes history is boring. Um, if you really get into it, it can be fascinating, but it doesn't always make for a good war game. So if the game feels like I think it should have gone, then I'm going to have a good time. And I feel like both sets of rules nail that. Um, so I, I'm same as you, both nines. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll let you move on to the next section here as we continue to dive deeper into these comparison. Yep. So now we're going to be uh, talking about gatekeeping. Um, so that we kind of mean like the entry threshold. Um, are there any mechanics that kind of make getting into hard cost of models, you know, or bespoke, I'll go with it. Yeah. Bespoke, um, you know, manufacturing or models or stuff that you have to get from them that that might make it harder to get in. Um, so for the first part of that is, you know, what gatekeeping mechanics, if any, helped uh 
or hurt uh, for new players. So that we're kind of talking about like specific dice tokens. Um, so this game, and we'll kind of talk as well later um, for mechanics, but it does use cards, um, and they are bespoke um, to the rules. It's not like a regular set of playing cards. Um, first edition, I don't think they were available for download. And once they were out of print, it was very hard to get them on the market a few years down the line. Um, second edition, you know, it's been three years. It's very, um, very, very hard to find them available on the market, but you can print them. Um, at, at least as far as printing them, I'm saying specifically to the company's site, Studio Tomahawk. You might be able to find first edition somewhere else to download, um, but that could be a problem for people getting in is you you need these rules and you do need their cards both sets of rules have um, counters but they have a page in the back of the rule book you can photocopy um, so that's great uh, you don't have to buy them uh, they never I don't ever recall them being available for sale for first edition second edition you can get a cardboard they're stamped the quality of my stamped ones weren't great um, some of them didn't punch all the way through and so they had to be trimmed and cut um, the other kind of thing that's a little bespoke for version two, it goes to D10s. A lot of that's not a super common dice in my understanding for wargaming. I know a couple of war games that use D10s. So, I, you know, if you're a fairly new player, you might not have very many D10s. You might have a lot of D6s, and then so just be aware. You do it's a version two is a D10 game. Version one is a D6 game. So um, that was just something. Uh, that I thought of. Um, but what what about you, Kentucky? And any any other mechanics that you felt helped or hurt as far as getting new players in? No, I think the the just like you said, the version one you can find on probably eBay is like the only place I've been able to find it with the 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 rule book itself and the cards about fifty bucks, which is not bad for what I consider a great system uh, that's out of print. Um, and, you know, it's pretty comparable to a rule set you're going to buy over the counter. Um, with version 2, the you know, me and you talked about it. One of the issues I had, I wasn't a uh, pledge backer, I think, like you. I didn't get the the cards at the outset, and so I ended up having to print the cards off. I was able to find um, cards, uh, you know, from an aftermarket uh, supplier at a pretty, you know, like 10 bucks. But, um, you know, the fact that they put the cards and all of those things as a PDF on their site, that's pretty solid. You know, kudos to them on that. So not big gatekeeping uh, threshold from there. Pretty ease. Uh, with version 1, you just would expect that from a, a, a rule set that's out of print. Um, but still, great rule set and pretty comparably priced if you buy it, um, you know, off eBay or somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so kind of in line with that, we're looking at, I'm going to talk about like the cost of models. Um, is it prohibitive? Um, first, I would say no, in the sense that it's a skirmish game, so you can get away. Uh, I think with one of my games, I was running twenty-two models aside for a two hundred point game with version one. Anyway, version two is a little bit higher model count um, for your lower, smaller in games, but still, you're looking at like thirty models aside if you want. That's pretty good. That's that's better than some other skirmish games out there. Games that call themselves skirmish games. Um, you know, you're looking at just less than a hundred for a skirmish game. So it's, you know, per side. So this was, you know, you could do thirty models easy aside. I thought it was really good. Um, but as far as the cost for the individual models, that kind of goes to the period. Um, if you're looking at French and anywhere specifically, I feel like. There's n there's nothing out there in plastic really. It's almost all metal range. However, once you get into um, American War of uh, Revolutionary War, um, there are a couple of uh, companies that make plastic models, um, so that helps drive down the costs. And then when you get into Napoleonics, you know there's huge numbers of plastic models out there. So kind of depending on what your period you're looking at might kind of dictate model costs, but it's so few miniatures that it's not really cost prohibitive. Any thoughts on on the models, Kentuckian? The, the the only thing I would say on the plastics is uh, where Warlord purchased the you know War Games Factory. They do those boxes where you can do it's like a militia box that you know will easily make it for settlers and pioneers um, on the frontier, as well as kind of their 
Uh, they're really the old models from War Games Factory. Um, so again, uh, I think they have their 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 minuses. But again, being efficient and cheap, those boxes for twenty or thirty miniatures are pretty relatively decent price. They do a, a, a an Indian box, a Native American box, as well as like a again, like you said, when you go to AWI, those will probably be the cheapest models on the market. Uh, but you have a, a, a boatload of companies, I think, that produce models in the period. You know, we were talking about this even earlier with North Star and um, uh, Galloping Major and all of these others that do some fantastic stuff. Um, so kind of, again, not, not cost prohibitive, uh, and especially with the size, just concur with you on that. Normally, when you're talking about a 20 or 30 uh, model game, which is, I think, what most of mine were as well, you know, you're not you're not going to be... Uh, hurting. Yeah, and so you kind of mentioned that ties into our next one um, with uh, is there a specific size or manufacturer requirement for models? And there isn't. It's a miniature agnostic as far as use whatever manufacturer you want, and there are loads out there. Um, and I mean, the rules really aren't intended, I think, for anything smaller than like 25 millimeters. It's kind of like a one for one um, skirmish, like a true one for one skirmish rules. Um, I mean, but you could easily, as long as you're, I think, doing individual models, you could very easily go down to 10 mil if you wanted. You just adjust the ranges as you you saw fit. But I, th I think you could comfortably play it in 25 to 30, or I know some people uh, play it in 40 mil. Um, but yeah, wherever you find models, you can buy them. There's no requirement. The, the company doesn't restrict that. Um, and you, you had hit on that, Kentuckian. Um, so the final little bit, um, book supplements, new editions, outdated old versions. Um, so we've kind of talked about this already as well. Um, I just, before we started, I was doing a cursory look for first uh, edition rules and cards. And I spent about 10 minutes and I couldn't find any. Um, so, you know, it, no. I, so I didn't put a whole lot of effort in it. Um, but, you know, then again, uh, my... Since I'm over here in the UK right now, my default for like eBay and stuff is is UK, and I imagine very few of the esteemed war gamers over here are going to part with their first edition rules of uh, muskets and tomahawks unless it was you know for medical expenses. So, and even then, it's probably going to somebody in the club. Um, so, it that can be prohibitive to getting the first edition. Um, there are no supplements or anything for first edition. Um, Second edition, obviously, we've talked about has its its supplements. Um, and as far as outdated old version, that's kind of the whole topic, really, right, of, of this specific episode. So, um, Kentucky, do you have any final thoughts on supplements, books, new editions? As no, in the not realm of the, gatekeeping. Not just uh, my 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 round out to get it to scoring would be. I give version one. I do think you know that's that's where I got my my second copy of the muskets and tomahawks, and I got my old man for I believe his birthday a year or two ago because he had a pretty worn out version. Is you have to stay on eBay. Again, you know it's it's a finite resource, so it's not always going to be there. But I've I've monitored it. When I do see it, it is about the fifty bucks. Um, you know, it's not always on there all year long. Um, but with, with kind of looking at what this is, the entry threshold, gatekeeping and everything else, cost of models, specific size, and then books and supplements, the new editions. I still give version 1 a 9 just because if you do find that book, again, I would put it, I'm putting it down. I'm, I'm the candy man today. I'm giving it, as I always am, I'm giving it a high score. But, um... If you do find that book, that's where I've bought the, you know, my few copies and the gifts I've given at around that $50 mark in the last 2 to 3 years I've bought, I think two or three of them. And that's pretty awesome for a great rule set that's got the cards and everything with it. Um uh, and especially again, the entry threshold to the system, not a lot, doesn't really it's not manufacturer specific, so great stuff as long as you get those cards. Version 2, I would give a 9 mainly for, yeah, it's only been out three years. I'd expect to see, you know, more of the cards and other things you can buy pretty easy or the, the rule set itself. Um, but I do like the fact that they, you know, have the the um, cards where you can print off. If you get the set from another, you know, manufacturer, you can still print the cards. So I'll give it a 9 as well as far as the gatekeeping goes. Again, introductory set game, um, not a lot holding you back if you were going to get into it 
for you know 50 bucks or less to get to get into the system the set and those things with version one it would just be timing it and hopefully somebody out there has um you know a copy they're going to post up for sale so you can buy it because it is a great rule set but yeah those are mine nine across the board for both of them on gatekeeping what about you winters so this is actually my lowest score and biggest split um i gave ver- first edition a four and I-, I gave it a four simply be at first i was going to give it a zero but i feel like <laughs> fair fair point uh, and and only in the sense that if you were to listen to this podcast and you're like man everything sounds awesome about first edition i want to go out and get it you're going to have a hard time, a much harder time, I think, than getting into the second edition or into most other rule sets. Um, now, it is an out-of-print game, and a lot of out-of-print war games are amazing and so worth their time and the investment of getting them. But as far as gatekeeping, it, that's going to be your biggest hurdle. We'll talk a little bit later as far as community. Um, you might not have to. I think you're going to usually find in, in a lot of gaming groups somebody who has first edition and will, yeah, as far as letting you play the game. Um, but yeah, I, I gave it a four just because it's it's out of print for a long time. Version second edition, I gave an eight um, because on a lot of the sites, the, the core rules and the supplement for you know Redcoats and Tomahawks is, un, is out of stock. Um, and I don't know when they're going to do another run. Um, they, you know, you can still get the Napoleonic supplement, but as far as getting that first one, um, it's not as as available as you know as it was. And I would think three years in, you know, like we said, maybe a PDF or something should be dropping or or a reprint maybe with a, a new supplement. Um, but availability rules is is why I kind of knocked these down um, for a four and an eight. Um, so that's all I had for this section. Kentucky, you want to start us off the next one? Yeah, so these next two sections, as we get into the meat, we, we expect to kind of go through a little bit of the differences in, in each one. And this, uh, you know, especially with playability and rules, mechanics, and nuances. So I'll first start us off with playability. And so the things that we're looking at in this section are how long before you, you, know, you have the system? Is it one to two turns or one to two games? Uh, can you finish the game in one to two hours, a day, a weekend, a long setup, tear down, putting models out? Uh, does the result normally fit the game or desired achievement? With playability, um, just like we said with most skirmish games, all of this stuff is going to be fast. For both versions, I see them very comparable, kind of setting them aside. Um, how long before you have the system, one to two turns or one to two games? I think with version one, you will probably get it in a handful of turns. I think version one is, um, you know, the cards, the units, uh, being very specific and not having the command point system or the nuances with, um, you know, some of the additional inner workings of traits or the side missions. I definitely think you'll have it in one to two turns, you know, easily. I think version two, um, you're going to have to have a little bit more reference. I know me and Winhurst talked about kind of going back and, and forth in the book a, a few times, and there were rules where I think I had it right, and then I played a turn or two on, and I was like, oh, this is actually what it meant to say. A little bit of depth, and not to say, I, I, in my personal opinion, I don't think it's you know overcomable at all, uh, or it's not overcomable at all, but I, I definitely think uh, playability for version 1 is very streamlined. One or two turns, I think I could take any war gamer to that table, and they'd have it. But with version two, little bit, little bit more depth there, a little bit more nuanced. Uh, how long do you think before you have the system, Winhurst? Yeah, so I, I agree. You know, version one was very fast and easy to grasp. Um, a couple of turns. It's harder to say in version two because it doesn't really do turns um, with the way the mechanics work. Um, however, mm-hmm. uh, both games it took me about two hours every time I played through them. Um, because I was doing the smallest level that they really say, at least version one, the smallest level is 200 points. Um, I think they recommend 300 points for a uh, second edition, but I, I wanted to more, I wanted to see if the 200 point threshold would still work in second edition. So that's what I was doing. Um, so they played fairly comparable. Um, I did feel like though in second edition, I had to go to the rule book quite a bit more often than I did in first edition. Now, obviously I played first edition. It has probably been three years since I'd last play it. So, you know, take that with a little grain of salt. Um, 
you know, I do have some familiarity with it. Um, and they are very familiar, um, similar rule sets as far as the layout because they, they didn't change everything. Um, but it did take me a little bit longer um, in second edition. Um, so I, I kind of agree with you on that. Yeah, and so, I mean, and maybe that's just a little bit, you know, we're full dis- disclaimer on this. We did play, I, I think we, we both played the comparable intro games with it. You know, we're looking at the the 200-point kind of threshold. Um, I, I wonder what that would have been if we'd gotten bigger to the 6 by 4 tables, you know, several hundred more points, um, and what that would have changed. Can't speak to that specifically, but I definitely think it's a... You know, one to two turns. I think we're streamlined for version one, and and you know, not much farther uh, for version two. But it depends on the nuance and maybe adding a few more things to it. Definitely, I don't think any system. I think you would have them down within a game or two. Like this would not be something that, you know, you you find a completely different way to play it. You know, the next time you play it. Um, the next one would be: Can you finish a game in one to two hours a day or weekend? I'm a firm believer, even with the nuances of version um, two. Um, again, most of my games were right at the the two hour mark, give or take thirty minutes. Um, so no issue with that in the the quick skirmish style, getting that up. And I would say, you know, probably two hours and forty five minutes with setup. Uh, we're not talking about big tables here, four by four to six by four. So Real small, few trees, building, house, river, you know, a little road, and, and you're there. You're in uh, 18th century North America. What do, you, what do you think on can you finish a game uh, in that amount of time? Yes. Hurts? So in the first edition rules uh, for scenarios, it says 200 points um, is a short game, and they, they, rec- they say less than 90 minutes. Um, it was taking me a little bit longer because, you know, I'm slow. Um, 400 point game uh, between two to three hours, a 600 point game, let's see, like an afternoon. Um, so like that's their own recommendation. I, I felt like that was that's pretty compare. If you, if you were very familiar with the rules, I'd say that's pretty spot on. Um, you know, maybe 90 minutes for a 200 point game if you if you both are both players are fairly familiar with the rules. Um, I don't know if they have that kind of breakdown in the second edition, but it felt fairly comparable. You know, once you had the rules down, I, I could easily see like the smaller scale games going fairly quickly like that. Um, so as a skirmish level game, I definitely think you're, you know, if you're trying to play it at the scale where you're, you know, you're looking at a whole day's worth of gaming, then I don't really feel like that's what this this game's intended for. You know, you, you should there's better rules out there for the kind of large scale battles that you saw during these periods um, than these. So yeah, definitely maybe an afternoon. Okay. Yeah. So they do in the forces skirmish three to 500 points in second edition says two to three hours and engagement more than 500 points, more than three hours. So I, I feel like those are both pretty accurate assessments for both rules. Yeah. The um, kind of looking to the next one, like long setup, tear down, putting models out again, I played, both, like we said, I, we kept it around the 200-point uh, mark. Real easy at that level. I mean, I'm talking 20 minutes uh, uh, max. And a lot. I think I'll save it for the rules mechanics when we talk about it. A little bit of stuff with the deployment zones and deployment points, um, but not not too much at all. What are your thoughts on setup and teardown and putting models out? When it, first? So I feel like this is subjective a little bit to the this style of game. So something you and I were talking about beforehand. So my games that I were playing were all, um, I don't want to say like, I, I was using Rangers, Indians, and Canadian like militia. So they're all units that thrive in like the woodlands. So my table was like three quarters woods. Um, I even bought extra woods ahead of time, uh, extra trees so I could have, you know, big big woods and that so that that meant it was a fairly um time you know it took a lot of time to set up the table itself for a game like that however with 30 models aside less than um that part was very quick i think your games you you had a bit more of a mixed um force uh, or like total force you're using um and you know that's yeah something that's i had a- i had mainly regulars with some militia and versus um uh, some native americans yeah, and so I feel like 
you know, with this set of rules, you're not going to do a soup. You aren't likely. If you want a good game, you need to make sure that the train terrain somewhat reflects the forces you're using because you're not line infantry are going to try and avoid being fighting in woods. Now, that did happen quite often throughout the period, um, but they're going to try and pick a battle area where they have some open. So you're probably going to want to have a mix or depending on the game, if you're raiding a village, it might be less dense terrain um, than if you're doing something deep in the woods. So I think that the setup and teardown for this game is really more affected on how much terrain you're putting on the table as opposed to the number of models you're using. And then I think both of us played on a 4x4, right? Yeah, yeah. Mine, mine was 4x4. Yeah, so the, another thing is, is you know, we could see, I think I could see the long setup and tear down kind of going, like you said, if you were going to do now, you're talking about a ranger force and a Native American force fighting on, you know, maybe some dense woods on a 6x4. That would probably be a little bit longer setup. But I, I based on where I see it uh, for that entry level and those things right now, I still think, you know, it, it wins out. Because, again, at the end of the day, it's the skirmish game. We're not setting up, you know, probably some of these battles aren't urban, you know, Stalingrad-like terrain here. It's mainly, um, you know, the forests of the, the Pioneer and, you know, stuff that's out here in the wilderness, uh, which can add some, some setup time, especially if you're going to use um, that in your terrain. I like the scenario generator from version 1 in the book where it talks about you know, the building in the middle and, and, and how it looks and how it dives up the table. So that kind of helps you to keep streamlined, but definitely not too much of a, of a labor intensive, depending on how many trees you want. Uh, Windhurst <laughs> is an arborist, right? He just plants trees everywhere. Um, but hopefully not too intensive. The next one does the result normally fit the game desired or achievement. I, I think you hit this earlier with the, when we were a little bit talking about the game. I think the skirmish side of it is is definitely, um, you know, you get the feel, you get the nitty gritty feel uh, for both. Um, there are some things where you're playing solo. I couldn't really get the um, the deployment, uh, the dummy deployment uh, chips for the the Native Americans and stuff that would have, I think, added a nuance to it. And then I think when you have the secondary conditions. Uh, maybe your opponent doesn't know. Those things would have added a little bit more flavor to it, uh, to the games that I played, again, where I played solo. Um, but definitely, I think both really achieved that for me. Um, I think we're, we're I'm, I think both me and Windhurst are veterans of version one. Um, so, yeah, that does feel like the 18th century North America for us. But uh, as far as the second one, I wish I could have uh, done a little bit more in the playtesting of version two. I still think I was able to take a good enough swab of it. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it, in my mind, it hits the nail on the head for achieving that 18th century skirmish in, in the woods of, uh, um, you know, the French and Indian war and the, the, the pioneer, you know, pioneer settlements and those things kind of going off around then. What are your thoughts on that, Windhurst? Yeah, I've, I've already kind of said it. Um, I, I, my notes, I really said, yes, both, they both felt like a small engagement in the 18th century in North America. And that's what I wanted out of it. Um, so I think they both nailed, you know. I'd say the, going to scores now, I I give version one on playability a nine. I think, again, kind of echoing back to it being streamlined, it condensed into those uh, 30 or actual 40 pages of rules. The 60, you're talking about scenarios and some other things in there when you get to the 60 pages of it. Um, it is a nine. It is, you don't really have to go back to the book. Uh, too much, uh, soon, especially if you have the one page or quick reference sheet with you. Um, with version two, the nuances and the little bit of depth that it have, there's a lot of stuff that's really cool. It gives a whole nother flavor to the game. Really love it and enjoy it. But as far as playability, I'm going to knock off a half a point in it and put it to an 8.5. I think it, it will take you a little bit of time to really appreciate all of that, that different depth. And with that appreciation, you're going to have to do some domain knowledge, you know, assessment and make sure that you're spun up to, mm -hmm. to get those things. I definitely think both games are, are worth it and their playability is is way above par for, um, you know, wargaming rule sets out there. But that's where I'll leave them at playability. Again, version one, I give the nine. Again, super solid. And then version two, I give the 8.5. Yep, I was fairly comparable, actually. All right. What about you, Windhurst? Yeah, I was fairly comparable. I was uh, version one and nine. Um, I think it's a, a phenomenal 
skirmish set of rules for this period. And similarly, version 2, I gave an 8, um, just because there are some of the mechanic things we'll talk about uh, in the next section here that I, I think kind of slow down your ease in getting into the game, like you, you kind of allude to nuances. Um, but yeah, I give it a 9 and an 8, so very comparable. Um, so that takes us in to awesome. our next... Awesome. Why don't you take it away? Yep. So our next one, um, we're going to look at the rules, specifically the, the mechanics and the nuances of the, the mechanics, so the real meat and potatoes, what, what changed um, between the additions. Um, so the first we're going to kind of look at, is it simple? Is the game simple or complex, the rules? Um, I kind of felt both were kind of an average complexity. We ta- alluded to this earlier, you know, it's... It's not a sim, but it is a little chart heavy. It's not, you know, quite beer and pretzel. You are going to need that quick reference sheet probably on hand because you do need to use some of the charts, and they're not really kind of the charts you're just going to memorize and and know, um, like the reaction tables or, or spotting tables, things like that. Um, so maybe not the best game for a new war gamer jumping in by themselves. Yeah, I definitely think they ought to be chaperoned into this game a little bit. Um, yeah, but as far as complexity, that, that was my thought. What about you, Kentuckian? I would agree. I think, I think simple version one is just, that's where it shines on that it is. It has enough depth that you can still, you know, probably somebody fairly new, you know, maybe even fairly new to wargaming can at least catch it, especially with the card mechanic and those things. Um, with, with version two, you do have that. It, it gets into... A little bit of complexness, but even at its zenith, you know, it's nothing like these two or three hundred page rule sets where, um, you know, you're not just breaking down every type of musket or rifle of the period and what their ranges are and those things. Um, so I still think they both kind of just echo when you err on simple, but I would say um, really love the depth um, that that version two does bring to the table. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that um, wholeheartedly. So next, um, pages uh, of charts, or is it one more of a one to seven modifier? So again, this is kind of alluding to complexity. Um, I definitely think this is a little bit more on the the charts. Like you've got a chart for that has like the weapon abilities and everything, and then like so you need to know like the um, the lethality of the weapon and then the shoot characteristics of your stat block for the units. And then you've got a shooting chart after you've done a spotting chart. Um, and it's pretty similar in both versions. I feel like version one and um, version two, I think the advantage is that version one was able to kind of condense it all down into one quick reference. So you're, it's a little bit more streamlined and using where because they added um the command point mechanism there's another thing you need to reference um where it does add some nice playability it if there's more now you have to kind of remember keep track of um so i felt like maybe version one's a little bit less because it's a tiny bit simpler and then version two is a little bit more um in depth because they added a bit more nuance um what do you think kentuckian yeah, I, I think you see this in the spotting. They've they've simplified spotting to some degree in version two, um, but I still think it has. Uh, if you just look at the rules at bottom without getting to a, a lot of the additional kind of the the side missions and those things, uh, the command points, even even with those, I still don't see it being you know pages and pages of stuff that you need to do and yet it helps to give you a huge flavor and narrative of the game and and also gives you a new nuanced way to play it with the side missions which is is great anytime you can play almost the same scenario same forces and you get a different side mission like that's just really that's a really cool nuanced way to help keep the game fresh and allow you to do it without breaking the bank on uh you know a lot of different things there Yep. So the next talking about crunchy. So I don't know maybe how we might each define this a little differently. So I'm thinking like this also kind of falls under that complexity. Um, you could look at crunchy as kind of a good or bad. Uh, I feel like these rules had the po- uh, the good potential to be kind of crunchy. So both versions, um, you know, you've got kind of traits and stuff specifically for your officers with um, kind of like personality traits with like side plots and missions it gets a little bit more in depth with that in the second edition 
Um, I didn't use any of those stuff in my my play tests, which I think is is why I'm saying it's kind of a good crunchy. You don't have to play with those kind of mechanics, but you can add them and add a lot more depth to your games. So if you want to look at crunchy, is like it gives you more to chew on. Um, I, I think both sets uh, versions of the rules do that, and I think version two does that a little bit better. Um, what do you think about crunchiness, Kentuckian? Crunchy to me means like the charts in the math tables uh, that we see in rule sets are the, you know, doing a lot of modifiers. You would think with the D10, that version 2 kind of adds to the list. Well, maybe there's a lot more number crunching and stuff that goes on. It still seems, you know, it's very streamlined, not too heady. I I know both of us talked about going back to the the books and some of those times of, of, you know, what was going on there, but... I still think it's it airs on the side of yeah it's I mean it it's well rooted in its skirmish style and even with you know the modifiers uh, going to a D10 and like we said you know it, version two if anything your your forces kind of flee a little bit sooner than in version one where they kind of stay to the last man so I, I definitely are the morale cards when they get put in so I think that there's the the way they've updated the morale mechanics, even with the, having the D10 and those things, they still leave it pretty well streamlined. Um, so I don't I don't see as having to do a algebraic formula or any type of crunchiness that would uh, keep you from being prohibitive or not not enjoying a, a quick skirmish game while still getting the feel of some decent amount of modifiers. Yeah, I, I agree with that a lot. Um, if putting crunchy in that perspective. Um, so you kind of alluded to some things. So game-changing mechanics. So we've talked about the cards. Um, this you to, For me, because I played this before I was introduced to Bolt Action, so for me this was the very first set of rules that had some other mechanic for deciding the sequence of play other than you go, I go. Um, so you've got a deck of cards, right? And in the first edition, the cards get all mixed up in a deck. Um, you get... A certain number of cards depending on the types of units um, some with one action or two action and then you flip a card and then it might say you know British Indians one action or you know French regulars two actions and then you go um, and so to me that was I really liked that um, I, they kept the cards in second edition but in the first edition rules they mention that an alternative way to play is to play with the cards in your hand so I think the intent there was, you know, so if you're just like a, a two-person game, you're not just waiting as the card play and the other person might be going. Even if you're not going, it's not you're, you're not moving models, you're still more involved. And they kind of made that all a second edition is. Um, and, but then to incentivize you for playing your opponent's cards, you get command points. So the big thing, you know, mechanic in the first edition was this card activation, um, and second edition took the card activation, changed it up just a little bit, and then added command points so you can kind of do other stuff than than just the the cards. Um, I don't know. It, the second edition specifies that it's a two player game, and so this is something Cutting and I were talking about earlier um, offline about how will this mechanic for second edition work in larger games of players um, where you don't have players feeling like I'm just waiting to be told what to do by the overall commander. Um, But yeah, those are are really the two big mechanics uh, in second edition. Did you have anything you want to add Kentucky in for kind of game changing mechanics or your thoughts on those mechanics? I really I agree with you as far as the the cards. I think that's a nuanced system. I'd really like to hear from the 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 group. We talked about it. You know, some of the best muskets and tomahawks games we played have been multiplayer games, and I think uh, I'd be interested to see how that was was done with cards in the hand, or if there's a simplified system. Whether you 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 put somebody as the commander. Um, the the one thing that I, I again I really love about that that ties to the narrative of. Uh, the story in my mind is the like the secondary objectives and just how they did that chart. I think that is so cool. Um, I think that's awesome. Um, it really adds to the flavor of the game. It doesn't really take a lot. I've heard people say like I, I think I watched a review on YouTube about why don't other games add this to it when you have like that kind of 
um, you know, secondary thing you're doing, especially if it's tied into the story. I think one of it was right the your commander's house or a family member's house is nearby, so you got to fight for that family member um, or that that house, you know, or or whatever. You want these people, these soldiers, to to stay alive. You're really loved by them, or you're really hated. You know, you want them to die. So for that unit, that's really cool. I think it adds a lot of flavor internally to the game and, and can really. In my mind, I just love it. it. It adds to the narrative of why we're playing the tabletop rather than just kind of like point and click, here's this amount of troops. It gives you that feel of, of being that leader, that tribal leader or, or you know, officer out there. Um, as far as um, the cards in the hand, we've, we've only played a handful of games. I really like it. I think it's a, it's a good technique with command points. I like how those can kind of interact. Um, I don't, I don't think it's totally like game changing, but I really love, um, that. And I just, I echo your sentiments about version one I, before, you know, uh, with skirmish games and keeping both players involved is sometimes difficult, you know, especially with war games when you have huge war games, but this one where you're on the edge of the seat waiting for the card to be flipped version one did that, you know, in spades back in the day, um, uh, before dice bag of bolt action and all those things, um, but in, in version two, I think is is adding on to that with the cards in the hand. I just I look forward to seeing how multiplayer games, um, how that's been achieved with multiplayer games, and I really look forward to hearing to the community about hey, if you've done that already and you guys have a good system, please post it up on on Patrol Facebook group and, and tell us about it. Yeah, I would something you you said made me think. I I would say good things about the card mechanics in first edition. If you're looking for a French and Indian War or this period solo play set of rules, Musk and Tomahawk's first edition is perfect because with the way the card mechanics work, I think it lends itself very easily to solo play. Um, I also think it lends itself so far from, like you said, Kentuckian, um, better to multiplayer games more than two players. Um, mm-hmm. Just because you can say you're in charge of all the skirmishes or all the irregulars or all you know, you can have your officers who are in charge of these forces be a player, um, and that works very well. But for just a regular two-player game, a skirmish two-player game, the way they do it with the command points in second edition, I agree with you, is is really good um, and very engaging. And I think that was a, a smart move if the target is just two players. Um, but like you said, we'd like to hear from other people to see how they do second edition in bigger games, because I know they're out there doing it. Um, and so with that, now moving into, do any of the rules break down or don't really make sense? For me, second edition went from D6s that it was in first to D10s. And I've heard some people, we you know, you might have seen our, our posts on Facebook. Some people said they felt like that offered a bit more range or nuance. Um, I didn't really see a whole lot of game change from the D10s. The one thing that kind of bothered me is that they use D10s, but it's not 1 to 10, it's 0 to 9. And I've always used D10s as the 0 being 10, so I, I definitely messed that up in my first uh, game of 2nd edition <laughs> for, a, for a couple rounds until I, I think I got to my first reaction, and I was like, I rolled a 0, and I was like, sweet, 10, they're not going anywhere, and then I looked at the chart, and I was like, oh, nope, they're gone. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute, I've been doing this as a 10 the whole time. Um so I don't know. That's that might just be personal preference. I I do think kind of talking about, you know, gatekeeping. You know, that's just something to be aware of. That uses d10s. Zero is not a ten, and that can catch you up if you're just not paying attention. Um, and then like we said about the cards, the one downside I having played run big games of first edition with the cards, I did run into times where, you know, maybe a player got all their cards right off the bat. And we had most of the cards available because we had a very large skirmish game, maybe pushing the ba- the border of skirmish game. And then they kind of were kind of waiting around until either somebody shot at them or charged them. And that's not really ideal. Um, and maybe that's why in second edition they decided, well, we're going to say this is a two-person skirmish game and that's the target. Um, but for me, that was really the only breakdown in first edition. But in second edition... Yeah, the the dice thing and then s- the cards maybe because I like to do games with lots of people. I just don't know how that's going to work. Um, what about you, Kentucky? Anything break down or just not really make sense? 
Yeah, I would say say in version one, I think some of the things that that really didn't. Uh, and again, if I've misinterpreted a rule or something, please somebody call me out on it. But I think uh, vigilance in version two is awesome. Um, basically, the idea to be on Overwatch. I think in version one, the cards were great, but there was this ability where you couldn't really be on like a you know somebody ran in front of you and you're just sitting there holding your rifle. And when you can't like react, when you when you don't have the reactions, I think version one didn't have like a really good system for that. So I think that um, it led to a little bit of shenanigans where if you had a British line unit kind of teed up, ready to go, and you had somebody kind of run down the road or something like that, and you you know didn't have your card, you weren't on vigilance, you didn't have the ability to do that. Well, you just got you know plowed down and. Um, it kind of, again, in a skirmish game, a little bit of shenanigans. Uh, very simple rule set. Awesome, you know, achieved it most of the time, but I do remember that happening on, on a few occasions. I think one of the things, too, about um, version 1 is, which was a little unrealistic, maybe not when you're looking at regulars, British regulars or French regulars, where you just shot this, this huge volley and everything that makes sense in version two is where the reloading you can do with like half your force and you're not, you're just firing half the weapons and you're reloading. That makes sense for maybe a, a British or French squad that's out there that knows, Hey, we might get overrun. There's a good thing to have volley fire, but I'm just going to fire half my guys to have the ability to, uh, do damage in case that, that makes a little bit more sense to me. Um, to some degrees in some situations again volley fire and some of that and the nuances that they have in the new system and the line fire are great uh and they really replicate the period and they did in version one but i do like the sense maybe if you're a little bit cautious you know that you're about to get overrun you're not going to do that you know you're going to have that that ability to kind of uh stay there uh, another i think to me I haven't got to play this, but again, in our, our preparation of this episode, I watched uh, a lot of battle reports with um, the deployment points as well, and it seemed like there sometimes were some shenanigans with bigger games, and I didn't play a bigger game. Again, I kept most of my games at the two to 300 point uh, mark, and all of my deployment uh, in version 2 didn't really have any issues. I think if you got to bigger games and you had the deployment points, that would be a little bit of a... Um, trying to fit 10 pounds of crap in a 5-pound bag. Those are some things that kind of, um, uh, you know, again, I don't know how I feel about them. As far as, you know, just the game changing, the clock, the specific event cards, um, I think those are great, and those are really real worth it. Again, I'm, I'm being nitpicky with some of my breakdowns, but uh, rules breakdowns, but uh, I, I still think it's uh, it's top notch i just think there are some things maybe in version one that they streamline and there's other things where i see what they were trying to do it maybe not be as polished as it needs to be in version two uh with the deployment and stuff but i i still see it as being a, a good idea and and being able to get it there yeah so what are you, your thoughts you see it definitely said some things there that made me think of some some others so another difference in version two from version one is the morale card starts in the deck um in version one, that morale card, so just explain the mechanic, <clears throat> when the card is drawn, that whole faction would have to test morale. Um, it would only go in the deck in the first edition after you've lost 50% of your force. In the second edition, if you everyone on that, that player's side will test if they've lost 50%. Otherwise, the p person playing the card can pick any unit of, I think, three models or less that have taken casualties and make them in the whole game and make them take a morale test. Well, the smallest size for some of the units is four, which means that unit in the You're very... You're testing pretty quick, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that unit could take one casualty, you know, the first time it's shot at, and then that card gets played, and they're gone, potentially, in the first, you know, what you would normally think of a turn of a game. Um, so I feel like it kind of breaks down there a little bit. The other thing that kind of affects both games... Um, for an aesthetic purpose, they recommend using like cotton and stuff to show the black powder marker, the show they shot. It looks nice. However, if you don't have tokens, what I liked the token, the fire tokens from second edition, because 
if they have fired and now they're moving and you're like, well, I'm just not going to reload for a while because the battlefield conditions don't aren't conducive to reloading. I need to move them. In first edition, it looked weird if you just had that smoke marker moving with them the whole time, like aesthetically. Um, so I was using the smoke one initially in the second edition. And then if they started moving, I'd swap it out with the token. Um, so that was just something I noticed. And I'm going to save the audience from correcting you because Vigilance is in first edition, page 11. It's on that same where they talk oh. about planning the cards. It is very slightly different than in second edition. Um, second edition allows you to fire at a unit that you wasn't previously spotted, but is in your line of sight. So if you had a group of Indians in woods far enough away where you can't see them, but then they shoot, and now you would be able to see them because of the black powder marker, you could then that would trigger your vigilance, and now you could fire at them. And so I think that was a very clever a nice addition to vigilance um but it is an optional rule in the first edition but it's i, I definitely think it was it's worth having as a generic rule um oh yeah and that's i think maybe that's the reason that we didn't play it a lot in first edition i and again i think the idea being is is that it led to some shenanigans and that's where you see most of the times sometimes these rules are work great 95 percent of the time 99 percent of the time but then you get into that one scenario and hey if you're not playing the optional rule um you kind of lose sight of that and that was something that again regardless i think as you said in second edition where it's now embedded in it it just makes a lot of sense yeah. and one thing i really like about both sets of rules is the way they do um the shooting like and casualties right so Everyone in the unit who can see a target can shoot, but only valid targets get eliminated. So I might have five people shoot at your unit of 10, but if only four of them are valid targets and I do six casualties, well, guess what? I'm only killing four guys. Those are the only guys I was you know, able to kill. Um, and I, the impossible shot, um, the mechanic in first edition f felt a little more impossible than it does in second edition. I feel like second edition, it feels a little bit more doable, like worth taking the chance. Um, especially, you know, I have to consider if the weapon has to be reloaded. It's like, man, it's it's a long shot. Do I take the risk and then maybe not having my weapons ready next time? Um, or do I just hold off? I felt like you were encouraged to shoot a little bit more in second edition because of that. I don't know if, if you ever ran into that. No, I... I I definitely agree with you on that, especially I took, I, you know, I played Native Americans and, and British line in my games, and it, it definitely helped out. I, I, I second the mark about you can only take the units you can see. That is a fabulous rule. Too many times you see skirmish games abuse that rule where they stick out one person behind the line, you know, and you're just wanting to shoot maybe a high-powered weapon or your long-range weapon, and then you're able to just take models from behind the building that you know would never have been able to be shot at. You got the one guy that gets your whole squad killed because he's got his head out. Um, so I love just a second, you know, kind of what you said. I love the the sense of that more yeah. more kind of accurate what you see on the table. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff, guys, is I think the strength of the the whole franchise. Like even the artillery, if you look at the rules, the the rules really try to simulate warfare in this period but without crushing you under charts and stuff because like you know artillery doesn't explode and like kill a whole bunch of guys because that's not how cannons really worked that often in this time period so even the rules and i'm not going to share all their secrets but even the rules for artillery when you look at it feel very right for the period so they do a lot of great things so the we, we could talk all day about this. The last little section in this in this uh, subsection, um, fiction, friction, sorry. Um, and we've kind of talked about this, but how does the game generate friction? And I think you agree, Kentucky, and that it comes down to the, the cards in first edition and the cards and the command points in second edition. Yeah, and I, I think they're both awesome friction generators. I think in version one, you see that, you know, maybe not novel at the time, but still kind of leading the pack in keeping both players engaged at the turn. I think in version two, there's a lot of depth that uh, I know myself, I still need 
uh, to ferret into that depth, um, especially with how it's played. Look forward to hearing back on these multiplayer games of it. But I really love it. I love the fact that you can have these same forces, same cards, questions about taking command points are doing it. And there's not, you know, some of the other games that we talked about, there doesn't seem this to be this overcomplication of friction where, you know, there's friction in every bit of movement as much as shooting. Yeah, those things are there, but they don't seem to like weigh down the game as, you know, okay, do I even get a shot or is this just a you know, if I get lucky, something right happens. It, it does, there's a lot of ways it incorporates what I see as good strategy from the, um, you know, the frontier, but I still think you've got, you've got a, a awesome bit of depth with the, the cards and now how you can play them and do the command points. So highly recommend it, love how it instruments it. And then the friction with the side missions, that's my last plug for the side missions, I swear, <laughs> um, is just really cool. It's a really, it's, a, it's a, another layer to the game that just adds adds a lot and it's not hard to do it and I, I i'm already looking at ways i can put it in other games i play yeah so talking about scoring for rules mechanics and nuances um for me i gave first edition a nine i just love it i think it's a great set um i, I didn't really have too many issues this with anything um yeah i love it i think it's solid Version 2, I docked down just a little bit. I gave it an 8, and that was just because of some uncertainties with the card mechanics and the decision to go to D10s. Um, I didn't really understand. Um, so I think maybe maybe a little bit more playing, um, and I'll, I'll see, ah, that it makes sense now, and I'll, I'll bump it up. But a 9 and an 8 for me. What about you, Kentuckian? I'm going to go a nine across the board. The one thing that I think, you know, version one does better with the simpler playing like mechanics, the the card deck, those things that are just kind of very straightforward gives it that nine. Although I think there is a little bit of, um, you know, a, well, a little bit of nuance and depth to version two, I still think it hits the nail on the head. To be honest, it might be, you know, who I'm playing or who I'm hosting for these games that I would be like, hey, let's try version one. Like, this is maybe a period you haven't played. You're not really familiar with it, but I think this person can get it in a, in a game or something. Or if it's somewhere where, you know, if I host you or host some people that have actually played the period and liked it, I still think I'm going to have a, a great night playing either game uh, and their mechanics are awesome. So I'm going to go nine across the board with just a little bit of variation for the reason I give it. Um... Moving on, we'll go, our next few sections here will probably go through a little bit quicker, um, but just still want to keep it consistent with our scoring. So I'll start us off by talking about opponents and kind of player community. The Looking at opponents, if I pick this game up, will I find a local opponent? Are there conventions that support the game near me? Are there local clubs that support the system? Do people house rule the system? If so, is it the same game with those rules? Kind of looking at these, at these kind of together here will you find a local opponent i honestly don't know my my sense would be telling me probably not you know they, these are uh it's a it's a system that even though like you said version two has been out for a while you know there's there, you see it sold out on some sites and those things but i will say this if you're lucky enough to really enjoy the period and get your hands on it i think you can make a local opponent in no time I think anybody that picks up this game or you host for a game will absolutely love it. Who doesn't love some of these um, awesome ambush scenes from, you know, uh, the Patriot, the movie, right? The ghost out there in the wilderness. Or you've got um, uh, <laughs> Last of the Mohicans and some of the great stuff that Daniel Day-Lewis does. And Mogwa, like one of the awesome enemies of the, the time. So I think you'll have no trouble in, uh, if you host a game, finding an opponent. Uh, what do you think about that, Winhurst? <laughs> Yeah, so my comment was possibly. I feel like a lot of seasoned players have one of the two editions. Um, and by seasoned, I mean not 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 war gamers who only ever play one set of rules. Like there's plenty of guys out there who only do bolt action, and they're very seasoned bolt action players. But I wouldn't call them necessarily seasoned war gamers. Like they don't have a breadth of experience. Um, so I would say most season, and I, I would tie this down with like your local club, like you're not going to walk into the local store um, on game night and be like, hey, who who wants to play Musk and Tomahawks? Anyone have it? But I bet you would find one or two players in most clubs around the world who have one of the two editions. Yeah, I would say I would say that's fair, especially with veteran war gamers out there. Um, these next two questions, I'll kind of 
tie them together? Are there conventions that support the game near me? Are there local clubs that support the systems? I think every wargaming convention I've been to, since again, being a wee little lad here, I've always seen muskets and tomahawks in some version um, being played. Uh, I, again, I just saw Charles, uh, I believe his name's Sharang, uh, there from Pennsylvania host an awesome uh, con game at, I believe it was Fall In, um, that won an award. So, I mean, I, I know it's out there, I know it's being supported. Um, it's a great it's a great system and again like i said i think if you're a member of a local club where people have been out there you, you'll probably see somebody that has a system would you agree with that did you see a lot in the gaming conventions in in england you've been to windhurst of people playing it i'd agree i'd, I'd say in in most large wargaming conventions some of the they have a lot of the kind of smaller one day events here and you don't always see it but yeah definitely the rest of that i agree with yeah, oh, and then uh, the, the, a nod to Tom um, from Ohio there at Tom's Basement. He does a lot of stuff on Discord. They just did a campaign there in the Ohio, southern Ohio, uh, in central Ohio portion. So there's a lot of people out there playing the system. The last one for here is do people house rule the system? If so, is it the same game with these rules? I haven't seen, you know, talking about Windhurst and with Vigilance, that, that rule was in there already as a, as a kind of an add-on. I haven't really remembered too many additional kind of house rules from from playing the other systems i don't really think you need to um i look forward to hearing back from the community on multiplayer in version two but um yeah i think uh, i think the rules really hold up um and when when we get into these other supplements maybe for the system it'll be interesting to see you know if if there's some nuanced or, or things on the forum that people want to change but what are your thoughts winhurst yep same i i never saw i don't recall any house ruling from first edition um, and I don't really see anything in either edition I would house rule other than maybe the card mechanic in a large game. But I, I, like we've already you know beat the dead horse. Uh, I want to hear what people have done because if there's a, an easy way without changing the game, I'd prefer to do that. Um, so, yeah. Scoring on this one for opponents for me, version one, I put it a six. I think if you're able to pick up the rule set or you're near a, a, a decent-sized club or group, it's into historical. Somebody probably has a copy. Um, again, that's I put it as above average, so six. Uh, with version two, I put it as a seven. Again, it's still been out there for three years. Um, I think there's a, a decent group, a network, especially um, you know that the games it. You can see the online post. the The Facebook group for Muskets and Tomahawks has almost three thousand people on it. Um, and if not, I, I think you should probably look at this rule set and you can easily pick it up. And I think you'll, you'll make an opponent in one or two games, uh, easily done. So those are my scores on it for opponents. What are yours, Winterst? Uh, I put both of them at a six, uh, for pretty much the same reasons. Um, I think you're just as likely to find somebody probably who plays first edition as second, just cause there's a lot of people who never made the switch over. So I think there's probably an equal number of first edition players out there as our second edition, um, so I think probably pretty good chance for either one, but not as mainstream as other rule sets. Um, so that's why above average, but not great. Um, so let's see, uh, so we got two kind of big more categories. This, this second to last one support. Um, so from the publisher creator and other companies, we've alluded to a lot of this stuff. Um, so we're, we're talking about, do they provide updates and erratas regularly? New supplements, um, do they keep the game fresh? Um, is the change normally good, or is it too much change? All right, this is not a huge mainstream game. It's not designed for competitions, so the company is a lot more reserved, I think, than you might th see other mainstream games. Um, so I'm just kind of going to lump these all together. Uh, they, the company, uh, Studio Tomahawk, does provide um, downloadables for all their current editions of games um so i think that's great um i haven't seen a whole lot of changes in the errata i don't know what version they're on i don't even think they've they've numbered the version on their site um kentucky can correct me if i'm wrong if he knows um but obviously we're talking about a second edition with supplements so yeah they they did update the game they made the changes they felt they needed to change i have some thoughts on that i'll talk about later um but yeah they are and they've come out with two supplements, and they've alluded to more. So, yeah, um, 
I, I think they're doing the right amount of involvement. Um, I, I do think they can maybe do a second run for second edition. Obviously, there's none of this stuff for first edition because it's a second edition. So this is a little hard to, to compare the two. But as far as the company supporting the product, um, I think overall they're supporting the product. Um, Kentucky, and what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I kind of just co-sign all, all of what you said. I agree with that. I would have expected in three years of the release of the second edition for there to be more than just two supplements that seemed to came out pretty pretty early on. Um, you know, the, again, with the pictures of the Anglo-Zulu War that's in the book, the Civil War and those things, expected to see those sooner than three years, but um, who knows? And again, we don't know really the inner workings of Studio Tomahawk or those things. These are just our kind of... Uh, Observations. So, if anybody's in the know, please again comment or message us and let us know. Do we expect to see a Civil War one? Is it is this a dead project and all the money's getting pushed into Saga, or, or what's the the case? We enjoy the game and we we like to see it. As far as kind of scoring these um, with the game fresh and everything, I I I'm trying to be fair to version one. I mean, what would it be a zero? Uh, you know, because again, it's it's the old version. It's you don't really do anything. I will say during its heyday, you know, it was up there. I'm going to give it kind of a middle of the road, five or six. And the only reason I'm going to do that is, again, it, it was pretty well supported when it was out. It was pretty well supported uh, during its day. I, I think there's a there's definitely an underpinning of a lot of war game communities that, that still have it out there and people that I know play it. We, Me and Winhurst, again, ferreted out some questions to say, hey, what are people's pluses and minuses with first edition? And we got a decent amount of comments that said, we play first edition because we liked it and we really see no need to change. So, yeah, maybe that's not from the creator or company, but it seems to, to be... Uh, out there and pretty well supported i'm going to put it at a six with version two um you know i'm going to put version one at a five or a six with version two i'm going to put it at a seven i would with three years since its inception i would have expected to see a little bit more um you know 70 in my mind seven is in that kind of c range of a score like I just I, I think there's there's more here and I don't know if it's version two didn't do as hot as it was supposed to or, or what the case may be but we just don't see it there I do like the things that they've the printables they've made on their their website and everything but um, just would have loved to have seen a little bit more there what are your thoughts Winhurst I, I scored mine exactly like you a six and a seven um, for pretty much the same reasons um, so I don't need to belabor the point but yep um, I'm same mind as you are on this. Yeah, so no, no, good good stuff. But moving on to now some of our last, we've got just a handful of categories left. Our support from third parties is our next one, you know, scoring one, two through ten. And kind of, again, these we, we knew we'd go over quick because we, we wanted to spend a lot of time on the mechanics and uh, the playability. So support from third parties. Do other companies support the game? Miniatures, terrain, tokens, um, you know, tokens, all of those things, the special stuff. So miniatures and terrain, I'm putting it a 10. We know across the board, based on this period, it's a very heavily war game period. It's not hard to get into, so the, the pocketbook doesn't totally prohibit you from building like a 300-man army here. We're talking 20 to 30 miniatures aside. Um, the terrain out there, the long houses that you can find, the scratch-built terrain, it's all over the place. Uh, and just like Winher said, I mean, I think I've seen people play this in 15 millimeter. Uh, so, you know, no pro prohibition against that. My only kind of push from third party is the cards are hard to get. I, I know other companies make kind of third party stuff for different games. I don't know if there's some type of licensing or, or, or IP agreement that keeps them from making this uh, from these type of, of tokens and those cards. You can still print them off on the site. Um, by Studio Tomahawk, but I don't really see a lot from other manufacturers and those things. I would put that at kind of a middle of the road of five. Uh, but those are my thoughts on support from third parties. I guess my, my scores would be for version one, it's a three. A different, you know, definitely you, you haven't seen anybody kind of pick up the mantle of producing the cards or anything from that older version. And then with version two, uh, I would put it at a seven. It is. It's very hard to get that stuff, I feel I feel like, offline. And it's great that you can print it on the site, but no third party has kind of picked up the mantle. What about you, Winhurst? What do you think? Um, I actually put both of them at a 9, um, excluding the cards, because I kind of feel like that would, for me, I kind of lumped that penalty under 
Um, you know, does the company support it versus third party? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, like you said, we don't know. We don't know if there's an open license and just nobody's bothering for either edition. But as far as miniatures available and terrain available, there there's so much. There's so much available. So those are high numbers. Tokens, there are specific token set you can get for second edition, but they're all kind of generically named tokens as well. So, you know, you can probably find third-party companies that make those individual ones, maybe not tailored towards this game, but usable for this game. I mean, Shaken is used in so many games, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I put both of them at a nine. Um, so last, so this is bringing it all together. Uh, so strongest reasons for and against playing the game. So here, if we're saying it's over a five, we're recommending it. Um, if it's less than a five, then we're not recommending it. Um, but we'll tell you kind of why, uh, the strong for and against it. Um, so I think the community is a little divided on the uh, two editions from a lot of the comments we saw. There's a lot of people who, played first edition didn't want to get into second or just preferred first better some people who only ever played second and absolutely love it um but i think overall i would give the franchise a nine out of ten i think it's it's really fun and the french union war is such a unique period with something for everyone you know it's got you know natives in the woods your rank and file armies you can do raids and skirmishes um, or line battles, you know, with skirmish support. Um, I think it's a great a product. Um, I do feel like it's hindered a little bit with the bespoke cards. That would be the biggest um, against, um, like we've talked about trying to get the cards. Um, my, my initially when second edition came out, I was very against second edition. I bought it. I got it early, and I got two sets of cards because I knew how hard it was to get cards. Um, but I've been a big Studio Tomahawk fan since, like, way back. So Muskets and Tomahawks First Edition was one of my first early war games. And I was a big Saga player in First Edition. And I saw when they up came out with Second Edition Saga, you know, they, they had done a whole bunch of supplements for First Edition. And then they changed Second Edition. They did this core book with supplements for periods. And they did a lot. They did, I think, like three or four, and they're still making supplements for that. So maybe that's why we're not seeing one yet for Muskets and Tomahawks, because they're kind of going back and forth. I kind of felt that they're like, ooh, this is a way to make money, because it was working for Saga. And then they tried to push that onto Muskets and Tomahawks. So I was like, why are you changing this amazing set of rules that's foundational to my wargaming um, upbringing? And it felt like it was a money grab, but... So I didn't really give it a chance until we decided to do this test. I think it's there. They made some good changes, and I, I think it's a good game. Um, it's still just a good game, and a, and a lot of fun to play. Um, and I highly recommend either version. Um, but yeah, I you know be aware. I, I don't think you know even if they were doing it just for money, I wouldn't say don't buy it just for that. I mean, the company deserves money. They make a really good product all the same. I don't think the quality of the second edition was affected necessarily by a need to be able to sell more supplements. Um, it's still an awesome game, and I highly recommend it. Um, Kentuckian, what, what about you? Final thoughts? What do you, what do you uh, score the strongest reasons? Nine. Nine, nine out of ten. For both. Got it. Uh, well, the, and um, I, I kind of put it as a franchise together. strongest reasons, I would think, for... Yeah, I would I would lump into version one and version two kind of a little bit together, although their scores all separate. Um, again, either one of these rule sets, the entry level is awesome. It's nuanced. It's definitely amazing and really cool for the the period it does. So those are my big strong like nuanced in the cards, nuanced in the uh, even with version one, nuanced in the command points and the cards in the hand. Uh, great entry level skirmish game um, and just really cool. The the thing my kind of knocks against it would be. There's some type of game within a game mechanic with the cards in second edition um, that I think um, it, it might be prohibitive to some degree. Although I think it, when you unlock it and you get it and you've got an opponent who gets it as well, I think it's going to be just a, a whole other zenith of gaming. And then my only other kind of knock, um, you know, would be those those opponents and the prohibitiveness to get the sets right now. Although 
they're out there uh, and just like we said with version one maybe not currently on ebay at the time they always do come up but those are those are something that are i think are going to be um kind of prohibitive so with version one with all of that being said definitely um you know a great game top game i would put it as a seven with version two i would put it at an eight those are those are great the last thing that we have to talk about with this system and our and our final tally is and we really just made this category to help us kind of capture anything else uh, in these systems and, and give us a decent 1 through 100 score is we call it the it factor. It was just things that we could talk about that maybe we don't put anywhere else in, um, in our analysis or maybe we don't have room for them or the game does something kind of different. We've just called it the it factor. Uh, is the game fun? Additional caveats kind of not captured in the other categories. The only thing I really have to add here, and I've, I've mentioned it several times throughout, so I swear to God it's the last time I'm going to say it, is <laughs> side plots in uh, version 2. Those are just awesome. Other systems need to do that. Studio Tomahawk, you are awesome leading the way with that. I've heard of a lot of different systems kind of doing this um, from what I've seen of Lion Rampant. Uh, and those things, and again, some of the other kind of skirmish systems. So kind of look forward to busting into those, but they really just help make the game narrative uh, rather than just a point and click, and it's 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 things like that that I really enjoy the game. So leading into this last um, kind of it factor and what I'm scoring, and I'll, I'll give you my overall score before I turn it back to, to Windhurst, I, I'm giving version 1 an 8. It definitely has it well above average game in the it factor. Um, you know, just awesome stuff uh with version two i'm giving it a nine i love those side plots i love the the depth and nuance it has to it and i look forward i'm not giving it perfect i'm, I'm looking forward to kind of what the other community you know what others out there in the community say about the multiplayer games and kind of how you other other things in there that maybe we've missed or thought of um that either you've you've had to house rule or you think hey you've even missed this point and this is a a really nuanced thing to the system so with version one even going toe to toe with modern rule sets, it, it gives an overall score for me at a 73, which is still, I mean, talking about decades old rule set and it's holding its own. You know, rule sets sometimes don't last too long out there, especially with the hot newness out there. But to 73 is definitely a, a good score for over a decade. And with version two, I'm going to give it an 83.5. I mean, if you if you don't have it, you probably need to pick it up. It's an awesome period, awesome to get into, and just like everything we said, real quick and easy and simple. And even if there's an opponent not out yet, if there's somebody in your community that knows wargaming, I think if you, you host a game for them, you're going to have a good time. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, solid scores for both systems. What about you, Winhurst? What do you think? Yeah, for me, the ick factor is a little bit less something specifically in the rules. And for me, it's it's the period. Um the French and Indian War for me is such a fascinating conflict to war game. And I feel like these rules unlock the potential of that period in a way I haven't seen in another set of rules around this time frame, um, the historical time frame. It, it's just, it's amazing. It's such an easy, inviting, enjoyable set of rules that you can use so few models for and have such a good time to play such an amazing, unique period. Um, that both of them just they're they're my foundational set of rules they're in my probably top five favorite wargaming rules um of all time and i i gave my score reflects it both of them got a 10 um for my it factor um total score also brought both of them uh version one to an 80 and version two to an 83 so i obviously highly recommend this set of rules in this period um, and with that low model count, if you can get your hands on the rules, there's no excuse not to give it a try. Um, it's amazing. You want to tie us up? Can awesome stuff. Um, yeah, no, I think that's it. Hopefully you guys gleaned something from this. If you were uh, you know, perusing in it, maybe if you were a, a, a version 1 standout and you were like, I'm not going to go play version 2, pick it up, give it a try. I think you'll, it'll be well worth your time. And if you're somebody that's never even uh, thought about the period or anything else like that, I really think, you know, if you get your hands on either of the editions, you're going to be pleasantly surprised with it. Um, and and I, I think you're going to have no time, you know, no issue making an opponent in your area, especially out of any war gamer, because it's just it's so much fun. Um, I'll kick it back over to you, because I know we have a last few little topics, and then we're going to, uh, you know, bounce out. But um, 
I'll, t- I'll kick it over to you for, for kit bag. Winters. Yep. So we always, like at the beginning, we have our caveats, alibis. Um, at the end, we have two things we like to do. The first one is kit bag. And that's just where we talk to share something with you all that we think is useful that um, we're using. You can put in your bag with you and take with you. Um, so f- in line with the theme of today's episode, mine is uh, the Raid series of books from Osprey. Um, they're pretty well tailored to... War gamers, I think. Um, I've got one in my hand right now, which is Tomahawks, Tomahawk and Muskets, French and Indian Raids in the Ohio Valley, 1758. Um, and I got it because it has a great breakdown of specific engagements and um, campaign strategies and stuff for the French and Indian War. Um, and kind of really tailored towards being useful to like the kind of a war gamer, not just a historian. Um, with some great, much better than even some of the regular Osprey uh, books with as far as illustrations for uniforms. I mean, it's got a, a great selection of color illustrations and color illustrations of battles, um, battle maps and all sorts of things for specific engagements. So I highly recommend this. Um, the series, um, look to see if they have stuff with the period that you're looking at war game. Kentuckian? Yeah, so I, I think that the wargaming compendiums, you know, the campaigns, the additional history and theater, theater resources are just awesome. That's kind of what we we're, we're uh, hinting at here in our kit bag uh, that just helps us maximize, you know, our hobby time and our research time and gets us, whether you think it gets your juices flowing for the period or it gives you that little refinement that you need and your color palette and those things, um, I think they're great to have. I recently uh, you know, purchased uh, some of the the campaign books from my Punic War series from Osprey and some other additional um, authors, and I just they, they they heighten the hobby for me, especially if you're historically minded. I think like me and Winter Star. So um, those are my we definitely have in our kit bag. If there are references or something that you can't live without for a period, please uh, feel free to post that on on Patrol. We really look forward to, we war game, as as Windhurst has said before, a lot of different historical periods, so we love having additional resources. If there's something else out there that is your Bible for your period, please let us know. Um, You know, it helps us kind of add to our hobby. Um, I'll move on now to our last section, is our scouting report. Again, like we're talking about, it's what's on our hobby table, what have we been up to, uh, and where do we kind of look to go from here. Uh, so I recently just hosted that Thanksgiving event. I normally host a, a few World War II bolt action events a year um, for the community. Uh, we did a Thanksgiving, had about 14 players, good show out, great turnout for a, a kind of a um, an emerging community of gamers here north of Nashville and in Clarksville, Tennessee, and had a great time. A lot of good uh, trophies got were, were handed out. A lot of good you know people uh, coming out and, and, and having fun near Thanksgiving. So good stuff. Um, unfortunately, I had a buddy here that was huge into VAS with us, got a job, moved somewhere else. I was able to play a handful of VAS games, uh, Victories at Seas is what that is, uh, the Warlord games, naval game. Awesome stuff. Um, I look forward to maybe getting some more VAS in over the holidays, but we'll see. Um, Hail Caesar 2, version 2, uh, my Punic Battle Report, I was able to get a solo game of once I had those armies painted, um awesome i really enjoyed it looking forward to to adding some more additional units and getting uh more hill caesar on the table here soon um if you've seen my my punic stuff it's still going i've made it through the carthaginians and the romans right now i'm working through some gauls have you know spanish and italian allies in the in the the litany list one thing that windhurst i think is breaking me off to do is i like keeping focused on the project and just spitting out these armies i've got you know, 64 Gauls on my table right now. They're about 80% done painted. Just need to base them and, and get the last little detail work. Uh, but man, when I look at the drove of, you know, hundreds of successors, hundreds of Greek hoplites, hundreds of more Gauls and all this other stuff, I'm like, you know what would be cool? And I'm kind of fired up to paint is some more muskets and tomahawks right now. So we'll see how that goes if I add some skirmish projects um, to, to my to my site and we'll we'll see what that looks like projects that i'm about to start is hopefully we have a bolt action league kicking off at the new part of the year Uh, i look forward to adding a new force uh around that time uh with the release of walking phoenix uh you know playing napoleon that's really got me looking at at uh, going back to age of eagles and black powder epic and and doing some painting on some brigades there but man you know that gives you anxiety when you look at how many miniatures you have to paint 
So more to follow. I do believe Windhurst has a trip planned to the States in December. So maybe next time we, we're, we're talking, it might be in person. And in, in, in preparation of that, I think I'm going to try to line out all these different games. So if I'm able to link up with Windhurst, I'll just, we'll be playing 24 hours a day. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get all, a bunch of good gaming in. So more to follow on that. Um, but yeah, that's what's on my scouting report and my project desk. What about you, Windhurst? Yep. So let's see. Um, I finished up the Norman Army finally. Um, photos have been already put up. So um, great sense of accomplishment. You know, getting that. There's, you know, some little tidbits. Um, I'd like to. I've got finally arrived yesterday some pennants from Little Big Ben Studios to go on a couple extra flags and the trays. <laughs> could use some basing um but no models left to paint the models are all painted and they're all in their units it's 300 strong not the biggest army but it um it looks good on the table i'm, I'm really happy with it um so next is the got one and a half units left to paint i've got one almost almost there of the saxons um and then that army will be done as well at the same same level everything painted in it um so hopefully you have some photos of that here in the next uh two weeks or so um and then after the I, I really love the backdrop I, I love the backdrop of that army man that picture that you posted the other day just looks awesome yeah that, that backdrop's worked out really well um yeah it's just a railroad backdrop um as opposed to the sky one i had before um yeah yeah it just makes the photos uh nicer but um, I think I'm going to move after the Saxons. I'm, I'm, I'll probably put it up to the community to help me decide because the muskets and tomahawks is one of my favorite periods. And when I got them out to set this up, I was surprised at how much I had added to the collection that I hadn't painted. And I had re started rebasing a bunch of them and never finished. So, like, you know, I want them done when they're on the table. Um, but my World War One collection is in, in the same position. Um, so... Compared to like an ancient armies, it's a fairly relatively small project, so I'll, I'll probably be reaching out for some help to decide. You know, should I tackle the muskets and tomahawks or World War One Eastern Front stuff before I move on to my ancient Greeks? Um, and then, like Kentucky said, um, playing a trip to Kentucky, uh, wife and kids won't be with me because they are going to visit her family in the Philippines for a whole month. So I'll have some dedicated hobby time on my own, and then I'm going to go back visit my family and then hopefully get down and see Kentucky and get a, a, a day or two of gaming in, um, which will be really nice. Cause you know, that's one of the downsides about being in the military is you make great friends and then you'll move to the other sides of the world or other sides of the country. Uh, and then don't get to see each other for a while. So the fact that, um, he's not too far away from where my parents are is, is, a, is really nice. And so I'm looking forward to getting to hang out with him, get some games in, um, so you guys will probably see lots of photos of lots of different games um, throughout the month of December. But, yep, that's all I got in my um, scouting report. So i uh, just like to send you guys off. So grab your spear and your shield, your musket, possibly that tomahawk and belt-fed machine gun, and join us on the next On Patrol. Dismissed. <laughs>